Good morning, everybody. How's it going? Welcome back to another episode of the Chronicles of Aguna, the Arsenal podcast, part of the 90 Min Football family with me, your host, Harry Simeon. It is a pre-recorded edition uh, just because I've got places to be this morning, but I figured I didn't want to keep you waiting too long for the reaction to Arsenal's victory over Luton Town, a victory that sees the Gunners go back to the top of the pile, albeit temporarily. And there's quite a bit that I want to kind of extract from this game. There's quite a bit that I want to discuss. And we're going to start off by talking about Mikel Arteta's team selection, because I think that's the big talking point here, right? Um, I turned up at the Emirates expecting to see some rotation. You guys that listen to the preview show will know that I was in favour of some rotation, that I feel like at this stage of the season, I'm looking at certain individuals and I just feel like, to me, they look like they're in the red zone. They look like they're at a point where they're very close to maybe breaking down or they're at a point where maybe they're not producing at their peak level. And I just think when you look at the calendar and the schedule that Arsenal have for the remainder of this month, especially, it's going to be really, really tough. And if you don't take the opportunity somewhere along the line to give people a breather, then it could come back to bite you in the ass. So I do feel like rotation um, was something that needed to happen last night. But I have to say, I didn't expect Mikel Arteta to make five changes. I thought you'd see two, maybe three. Um, and I thought that he'd utilise different players in different positions to try and make that work. For example, I was quite sure that Bukayo Saka probably wasn't going to play. Um, or in my mind, he shouldn't have played, even if he was fit enough to be part of the squad. But I would have played Jesus, who obviously featured at the weekend on the right wing to accommodate that. Instead, Mikel Arteta went, nope, we need to make this completely fresh. You know, I'm going to take a bit of a risk. I'm going to take a bit of a, a gamble here. And it was a gamble because people will say, well, it's Luton Town at home. And if you can't rotate against Luton Town at home, then who can you rotate against? And I understand that. But I just think at this stage in the season, when every game matters so much, when nothing less than three points will do, to make five changes and bring in a number of players who haven't played or haven't started a game for months is really, really ballsy from the boss. And he had to get it right. And he did get it right. Arsenal managed to get the three points. Was it the most spectacular performance? No. And I would argue that you could see, I guess, a bit of a lack of cohesion and a lack of rhythm in the early stages of the game, especially because of those changes. But the quality shone through in the end and Arsenal had enough to get over the line and beat Luton Town. So it's kind of the perfect scenario. You've got the three points in the bag. You go back to the top of the league for now, but you've also managed to rest some key players. You've not had to push your luck with people who are very much on the edge. Somebody like Bukayo Saka, for example, who we're going to talk about in a bit. And yeah, you, you've got the outcome that you wanted. In an ideal world, Arsenal win 4-5-0 and improve the goal difference further, given that Liverpool face Sheffield United tonight. But we don't live in an ideal world. And Mikel Arteta had to decide between whether he goes all out to try and score as many goals as possible, but takes risks with the fitness of certain individuals, or if he just tries to get the three points. Even if you pick the best 11, though, shall we say, there's still no guarantee that you're going to score four or five. This is the Premier League. It doesn't work like that. But I thought the team selection uh, was really, really ballsy from Mikel Arteta. Zinchenko, Partey, Emil Smith-Rowe, Nelson and Trossard will came into the 11. Kivior, Rice, Jorginho, Jesus and Saka all dropped out of the 11 that, of course, got that draw up at the Etihad. A little bit of an update on Bukayo Saka. Uh, Mikel Arteta said before the game that it was precautionary, that he didn't um, you know, show as much in training as he'd have liked in order to then consider him for this game. Um, he was asked... 
by uh, a colleague of mine in the radio room, Nigel Bidmead. He asked him if, you know, that meant that Bukayo Saka was definitely going to be available at the weekend. Mikel Arteta said yes there. But when he went in the press conference, I'm not sure that he said that. I think he said something along the lines of, well, let hopefully he can train tomorrow and then we can see. So Mikel Arteta being deliberately vague on the details when it comes to Bukayo Saka, even before the game, right? He said something along the lines of to the TV broadcasters, you know, he hasn't, you know, he hasn't passed all the, the points in training or, or tests in training that I put on him to make him available for this game. I'm paraphrasing, but that's basically what he said. There was still no word on what exactly the issue is, how severe the club think it is. They want to keep people guessing, I'm sure. But I do believe that the decision to take him out of the squad completely yesterday was because they want him available at the weekend. And they felt like they could take that bit of a gamble and that bit of a risk given the quality of the opposition last night and that it would still be okay. But really, really interesting stuff. I think the team selection was was the big talking point. I have to say, in the lead up to the game, there were a number of these players that had come in that I was worried about, right? I wasn't really worried about Zinchenko. I thought he'd play anyway. Those that watched the preview show, you'd have seen my 11. He was in it. I was a little bit concerned about Thomas Partey coming into the side, not because... I was concerned about him coming into the side full stop. I said again that I'd have picked him and I'd have played him. But for me, it was who we put him up into the midfield with. Now, I looked at it and I thought Odegaard, Emil Smith-Rowe, both really attack-minded players. And at times this season, we've given Declan Rice the job of sitting as a kind of lone six and essentially holding the midfield on his own. And he's got the fitness and he's got the power and he's got the mobility to do that. And I never really worry about it when it's Declan Rice. But Partey hadn't started a game since August. So to throw him into a Premier League game and expect him to do that all-encompassing, dominating six row, I thought was a bit of a gamble and a bit of a risk. I thought Partey was really good, actually, in the first half. Not as physically good as we've seen Thomas Partey in the past. And I've seen some people on social media saying, physically, Thomas Partey's finished, etc., etc. Look, he needs time to build that back up. First start since August, he was never going to be in tip-top shape, in tip-top condition. But I think you saw glimpses of what Thomas Partey brings to the team. The forward passing, the forward thinking, the composure on the ball in those deep areas, the ability to receive facing his own goal. I thought all of that was on display and it was really, really good to see. Emil Smith-Rowe came into the side and again, I was a little bit worried about what that meant for the midfield dynamic. But I think he had a really, really good game actually. I thought he was really good. Um, I thought he was proactive in terms of going and seeking the ball in different areas. I thought he was really willing to try and win the ball back in duels whenever um, it was in his vicinity. I thought he made some good runs forward. There were some nice turns, some nice touches. Obviously, he was involved heavily in the Reese Nelson goal. Um, well, I say Reese Nelson goal. It was an own goal in the end. Um, he was heavily involved in that. And he probably should have scored one himself after a brilliant piece of play involving uh, Martin Odegaard as well. Um, so, yeah, you know, good, good performance from him. I felt like he took the opportunity, Emil Smith, where he didn't really um, set the world on fire in terms of being at it all night long. But again, when you haven't started for a while, you're not going to be at the peak of your powers. I think given the circumstances, given the way that the team was a bit disjointed because of the changes outside of just him coming in, I thought Emil Smith-Rowe had a decent game and, and did a pretty good job of staking a claim for a position in this side moving forward. Reese Nelson also came in. I didn't think Reese Nelson was great. I thought there was a lot of running. I thought there was a lot of buzzing around people, but not that much in terms of actually affecting the game. And when you go back to that second goal, when the ball was cut back, He's completely missed it. He's completely missed it. And he's so lucky that there's a defender behind him who can't sort out his feet in time. And the ball's ended up in the back of the net. Um, Trossard wasn't great for me. And I'm focusing on the players that came in. Um, Zinchenko, I thought, had some good moments uh, on the ball. And defensively, he looked okay yesterday as well. I know it wasn't against the greatest opposition. Um, but no real complaints about his performance from me. Um, I said it would be 2-0. That was my prediction in the preview show. I'm pretty sure it was. Anyway, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, we did take our foot off the gas a little bit in the second half. But I think, again, that's part and parcel of 
you know, making changes. We were able to then make five substitutions in the game as well. So in terms of the squad management side of things, it probably couldn't have gone any better for Mikel Arteta. Gets the result he needs, but also gets to make five changes before the game, makes five changes in the game. And at no point did we look in any danger of not getting all three points. The first goal, obviously, is always the most important in these kind of scenarios. Um, and it was a really, really good finish from the captain, Martin Odegaard. He and Havertz combined really well after Arsenal won the ball back. And the way he finished it, I thought was brilliant. The way he sliced across the ball and caught Kaminsky out at pretty much his near post, I thought was was really, really impressive. Um, I also want to touch on a couple of other points. Um, I, I just want to go back to Emil Smith-Rowe because we've been talking a lot lately about his future. And in the preview show, you know, I said that I'm not really sure where he fits in. And regardless of the fact that he put in a pretty good display yesterday, and it was a good display, you know, there's no there's no denying that. Whether you're a, a big skeptic of Emil Smith-Rowe's, critic of Emil Smith-Rowe's or not, you can't deny that he had some impact yesterday and that he played quite well given the circumstances. But it got me thinking last night on my way home about his future. You know, he can come into the side here and there. He came in against Nottingham Forest and he'd done okay. He comes in against Luton and he does okay. I still don't see, though, where Emil Smith Rowe's future in this Arsenal team lies. I, I, I just, forgive me, you know, feel free to rip me apart in the live chat. Feel free to be super critical of me. Um, I just don't see it. I don't know what his role is, what it should be. I'm actually surprised that Mikel went with him over Vieira yesterday because he's tended to go uh, with Vieira, but perhaps that's a testament to what Emil smith Rose putting in on the training ground at the moment. Um, you know, I, I, I'm struggling a little bit here. Not because I want us to sell him, not because I want us to move him on. But I also think that when you're in a position where you clearly want to take that next step and go and bring in a big, big sign in this summer, which we think is going to come in in an attacking position, maybe it's as a centre forward, maybe it's as a, a winger, because I think you could argue that particularly on the right, we could do with some reinforcement there as well. I just, I just think that at some point you're going to have to make quite difficult decisions and you're going to have to move on players. That in an ideal world, you wouldn't move on. And Emil Smith-Rowe, for me, falls into that category. I think about the fact that, you know, his stock was so high when he broke into the Arsenal team. I think about the fact that he's clearly got quality, homegrown, all of that stuff. It means he's got value. The only drawback when it comes to Emil Smith-Rowe, and the only thing I'd be concerned about if I were a prospective buyer, is his fitness record. You know, and people keep telling me that since he had that operation, earlier on um, this season that he's overcome that issue or was it last season? I can't remember, but that he's overcome that issue now and that there was an ongoing thing that has been dealt with. And now it's just about building up some rhythm. And at Arsenal, unfortunately, because of the competition for places, because of how well the side's been playing, he's not been able to make that breakthrough. Did he take that opportunity last night with both hands? I wouldn't go as far as saying he was unreal and he made it really, really difficult for Mikel Arteta now going into the weekend to take him out of the 11. Some will say he did. I don't think he did. I think it was a solid display in a, um, in a team that lacked rhythm, in a team that lacked um, cohesion. And I think that what you saw from Emile Smith-Rowe was his quality shine through on an individual level um, when the collective wasn't quite at its best. When Arsenal are at their best, they're a well-functioning machine. And I don't know what Emile Smith-Rowe's role is in that machine. And I'm very much someone who loves individual brilliance and thinks that actually the way the modern game's gone and the emphasis on systems has maybe seen us lose a bit of that when it comes to those maverick players, those players that are going to pick up the ball, make something happen alone. I think we, we're we ultra focused on systems now. That's obviously the way to go because, you know, all the top coaches are doing it. But I just look at Emil smith and I don't know where we go with him from here. I think we're in a win-win situation because if he continues to come in and play well, then obviously that drives his value up ahead of the summer. If we choose to sell him and if we choose to keep him, then we've got a player who's worked his way back to fitness, but is also uh, much higher in confidence. So I think we're in a win-win with Emil Smith-Rowe. But regardless of the display we saw last night, and regardless of whatever impact it is that he has between now and the end of the season, I wouldn't be surprised 
if Emil Smith Rowe was to leave Arsenal come the summer, because there is a need to generate funds in order to do some of those big deals that we've been talking about. On Thomas Partey, I touched on sort of some of the good things that he did yesterday. Um, there was one move that involved him, Martin Odegaard, and Emil Smith Rowe that ended in an Emil Smith Rowe shot, which was saved quite well by Kaminsky down to his left. But that was an example of Thomas Partey's progressive passing. And people are going to disagree with me on this, and I'm fine with that. I believe that Thomas Partey's progressive passing from deep is as good as if not better. In fact, I would say it's better than Declan Rice's. I think Declan Rice gets you up the pitch in a completely different way, and I'm not knocking it. There's nothing wrong with that. But Declan Rice is far more of a ball carrier than someone who spots those passes from deep nice and early and plays those vertical balls into the likes of Martin Odegaard. And I think earlier on in the season, when we were talking about Arsenal maybe lacking that um, cutting edge and that creativity, a big part of it was the fact that we didn't have Thomas Partey. And so to have him back and to see glimpses of that at this point is encouraging. I'm talking about it maybe being the end of the road for Emile Smith-Rowe at Arsenal. I think it is the end of the road for Thomas Partey at Arsenal. I think that come the summer, the Gunners need to move on from him because we can't be paying big wages and being reliant on somebody who just isn't going to last the course and isn't going to last the distance. And this is not me being rash or, or judgmental based on one season where he struggled. This is something that's been ongoing for a long time with Thomas Partey. And I do think it's time that we uh, we consider making that change. But he could be massive, absolutely huge in the running. OK, um, I do want to talk a little bit about Kai Havertz, not because I thought he was really good last night, not because I you know, am trying to push the Kai Havertz narrative, as people like to say. Um, but I asked Mikel Arteta a question about him last night. And I got quite an interesting response, which I want to share with you guys here on the Chronicles of Aguna podcast. Don't go anywhere. OK, so um, I spoke to Mikel Arteta last night after the game. And obviously, when you're the last one to ask a question, all the obvious questions are taken and gone. So I was standing there and, you know, everybody else was asking him what they wanted to ask him. And, and I was standing in the radio room and I'm thinking, what can I ask him? What can I ask him? What can I ask him? That hasn't been asked already, but I might get an interesting answer to. So um, thinking about Kai Havertz and the role that he's been playing in recent months, he's been playing at centre forward. Um, he's been making, as Rob Edwards pointed out in his press conference, really interesting moves, dropping deep and then spinning off of people and looking to run in behind, giving us that direct option, uh, but also combining really, really well with those around him. I asked Mikel Arteta if, from the day he brought Kai Havertz in, have his plans for the German changed? So what I was getting at was, is this a case of Mikel Arteta looking at him and going, I think you fit X position, but having had him at the club, having worked with him so closely, has his view and opinion on where best to use Kai Havertz changed? And is that partly why we're seeing him playing at centre forward right now, even ahead of Gabriel Jesus. And Mikel Arteta said to me, the plan was that he's a very versatile player that can give us three or four positions. That's what he's doing now and has been doing this season. At the moment, we use him as a nine, as an eight, and this is the interesting part, and even sometimes as a seven, which we haven't done yet, but we will at some stage. And he's responded really, really well. So Mikel Arteta making the point that in his eyes, Kai Havertz is so versatile that he can play not just as an eight, not just as a nine, not just as a 10 in that kind of hole, but he can also give us an option in a wide position too, as a right winger, as a left winger. That 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 caught me off guard. Um, versatility, yeah, Kai Havertz has got bags of it. I think we all know that. I think we can all agree on that. We've seen it over the course of this season. But Kai Havertz, the winger, I'm not sure. Um, I think that is a good fit. But obviously, he's played at left fullback for Germany, which again adds another kind of string to his bow. And Mikel Arteta clearly feels that he can play in that position and didn't just say he can play in that position. Like I mean, he said loads of times that Smith Rowe can play as a false nine. He's very rarely done that, though. But Mikel Arteta went out of his way to tell me that we haven't done it yet, 
using him as a winger, that is. But we will at some stage. So I thought that was really, really interesting. Let me know your thoughts on that in the comments. Can you see Kai Havertz operating from one of the wide positions? So Arsenal go back to the top of the league, but of course Liverpool are in action tonight and have the opportunity to uh, regain top spot. And I'm sure they will up against uh, an, uh, a Sheffield United side who have become the whipping boys of the division. Manchester City also won last night. They battered Aston Villa. Aston Villa's team was a little bit strange to me. I have to look into the reasons why Unai Emery went with the team that he did, um, but I wasn't happy when I saw it, put it that way. Uh, also though, Manchester City made host of changes too. And I think there's a wider debate um, around whether or not this hectic schedule is having a negative impact on the Premier League, because we're seeing managers right at the business end of the table who are under immense pressure to pick up results, feeling the need to shuffle their pack. Now, they'll tell you publicly that they trust their squads and all the rest of it, but no manager would rather play a weakened side. They're doing it because they feel it's a necessity and that will be because of the schedule. So I do think there's a conversation to be had about that. There is uh, a few questions of yours that have come through to me on X overnight that I'd love uh, to dive into. So we're going to do that now. Um, Tom, going back to the Emil Smith-Rowe thing, says uh, it was just a case of getting the three points last night with valuable squad rotation. Is there any chance that Emil Smith-Rowe can be a big player in the running? Yeah, there is a chance, of course. You know, everybody um, can have an impact. I think Mikel Arteta said this the other day when we were building up to the Luton game. I think he said something along the lines of, and I'm paraphrasing, you know, it only takes one moment to have a big impact on this title race or on your team season. And of course, Emil Smith-Rowe, who came in last night and did a pretty good job, is one of those players that could easily, um, easily have an impact. SJ Cliff says, what do you think of Emery's team selection against Man City? I've lost a lot of respect for him tonight. Um, I looked at the starting 11 and I thought, hold on a minute, that's a bit odd. And then I looked at the bench and some of the names that I was expecting to see in the starting 11 weren't even on the bench. So I, as I say, I do need to explore um, in a little bit more detail whether some of those players will be rested or if they do have injury problems. Um, but it was certainly a much weakened Aston Villa side. But equally, Man City made changes too. Um, Haaland didn't start. I don't think De Bruyne started either. Um, Walker didn't start. Stones didn't start. Let me just bring up their team just to make sure um, that I'm not just making this up in my head. If you look at their side, um, Rico Lewis played Ruben Diaz, Akanji, Gvardiol, the, the back four that ended the game against Arsenal. Rodri and Bernardo Silva in the middle. Doku and Grealish came in. Uh, so De Bruyne uh, came out of the side and Haaland wasn't up front. Alvarez came in instead. So they had Stones, Kovacic, Haaland, De Bruyne all on the bench. So they made changes too. And that's why I think this is a wider conversation and discussion about where the Premier League is at with this crazy schedule that we're dealing with at the moment. Uh, Zed Tom says, who would you say was the biggest winner from the players that were given a chance today? Emil Smith-Rowe for me. I mean, Thomas Partey, we all know that he's good enough to be in the starting eleven when fit. For me, it was just about him getting more minutes under his belt and getting back into that habit of playing that very specific role in this Arsenal team. Um, but Emil Smith-Rowe was the winner for me. Zinchenko showed glimpses, which, again, we know are there, especially in possession. It's out of, the, out of possession that we worry about him a little bit. Um, Nelson didn't really do enough for me. Uh, Trossard didn't really do enough on the night. I think Emil Smith-Rowe is definitely the winner. If we're talking about losers, and I, I don't really want to brand them as that, given that they're Arsenal players, but then you have to talk Reese Nelson because I thought he was the one that had an opportunity. He hadn't started a game, I don't think, since 2020 during the COVID stuff in the Premier League. And yet he gets this opportunity because of the absence of, uh, of Bukayo Saka, because Gabriel Martinelli and Gabriel Jesus are not quite at 100%. And for me, he didn't take it. Uh, Zed Tom also said, I thought it was an enjoyable game, a different team, but still a lot of lovely football. I thought the first half was enjoyable at points. I thought the second half was dreadful. I was literally looking at the clock and it felt like it was in half speed. It was really, really boring the second half. But I was just keen to see us maintain the clean sheet, not give anything away, not put ourselves in a position where for any reason we needed to be nervous or concerned. And we did that. It was a professional second half display that was, again, disrupted by 
you know, not just the changes we made pre-kickoff, but the changes that we made in the second half. But all of that was designed to protect players and make sure that we're in tip-top form for the game against Brighton and Hove Albion at the weekend, which is going to be, I have to say, a lot tougher. I'm going to leave it there. Thank you all so, so much for joining me. If you've got any more questions, leave them in the comments section below. I'll pick those up uh, a little bit later on today and we'll include them in the Brighton preview show, uh, which we're going to be recording and releasing tomorrow morning. Thank you, as always, for your support. Arsenal are back top of the league, at least temporarily, so you can enjoy it up until this evening. Thanks for tuning in, as always. You've been listening to the Chronicles of Aguna. Like, subscribe, share, leave a review, all that usual stuff, and I'll see you all soon. Until the next one, goodbye.